Okay, good evening everybody. Welcome back to Exploring the Lord of the Rings. This is Corey Olson. This is session number 93 of Exploring the Lord of the Rings. And uh, session number 93 is a particularly exciting session. Because tonight, yes, tonight, we are going to finish book one of The Fellowship of the Ring. It is pretty exciting. Um, uh, for those of you who haven't seen it, I strongly recommend... Uh, we have two slides, so I'm super confident we're going to do it. In fact, I'm even hedging my bets, because tonight not only do we only have the two slides, but I've rearranged things so that most of the notes and query slides I'm keeping until after we do those two slides. You see, to guarantee that we get through those two slides. Um, anyhow, so... Uh, if you haven't seen it on the uh, on the, the the discussion board on the questions for Narnian section of the discussion board, which is on forums.signumuniversity.org, um, you can find uh, Evil Doctor Cannon just recently posted some updated statistics of <laughs> that he was that he was looking at, and apparently um, he uh, he according to his calculations at the current pace, not the reckless pace that we were at at the beginning. But according to the current pace, uh, by his calculation, we are on pace to complete The Lord of the Rings sometime late uh, in the year 2031. Um, uh, so, so that's, that's I think, pretty exciting. Um, uh, I, I think that would be an excellent, uh, an excellent pace, all things considered. Um, I'm totally I'm totally, I'm totally cool with that. Uh, so that's that would be if we get there. That would be almost 14 years I will have spent on our discussion of of the Lord of the Rings, which I think is great. Now, Evil Doctor Cannon, you correct me if I'm wrong, but that doesn't include the appendices, right? That's just through. Well, I'm back, right? So if we needed to do the appendices and stuff, we'd. Uh, We'd have uh, we'd we'd have to probably tack a little bit onto that, but it was funny. I was uh, I was talking with my son in the car today about this, and uh, you know we were kind of joking about <laughs> like both of my kids are going to have graduated <laughs> college and <laughs> everything else. It's going to be really funny. Um, so yeah, this will be great. Yeah, so my kid who was uh, in the third grade. I think no fourth grade. It was in the fourth grade when we started. We'll have graduated college by the time we finish the book. Um, so um, it's pretty. Um, it's pretty good. Uh, anyhow, so um, yeah, boomful. We're totally gonna do the. Uh, totally gonna do the appendices. That that's obviously gotta happen. Uh, and we I certainly will want to go back and do the prologue as well, which of course we skipped. Um, and then Tarlonio, then we can go back and do chapter one again. That makes perfect sense. Absolutely. Um, uh, so um, anyhow, I, I thought that was uh, really fun. So thank you, Evil Dr. Cannon, for, uh, for your uh, statistics there. Um, it would be fun to have a collection of like before and after pictures, right? So like people take, take pictures of your kids at the beginning of class and then we'll see what they're like afterwards and everything. Um, yeah, it's um, it's gonna be it's gonna be it's gonna be pretty awesome. So, you know, tonight's a night for milestones, for thinking back and reflecting on uh, uh, on this kind of uh, on this kind of progress. So, uh, because we are finishing book one tonight, it is so exciting. Um, Anyhow, so, yeah, Mad Violinist, it's exactly going to be the problem, right? Uh, he says he's envisioning somebody discovering the podcast in 2030 and trying to catch up. Yeah. <laughs> Hrothgar's going to plant a tree and monitor its growth. That would act, that'd be really funny, actually. That, that's very good. Um, yeah, so it's going to be, um, it's going to be, it's going to be awesome. I think that's uh, the fact that we're going to be able to measure this in, uh, 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 you know, very like life epochs, right? It's gonna be it's gonna be totally different. Um, so yeah, JJ makes that's exactly what makes sense to me. Tolkien spent his life creating Middle Earth, and we spend our lives studying it. You know, I, I sometimes think back um, in the first you know maybe three or four years after I'd started the podcast. You know, some people were saying, you know, 
the day's going to come when you're going to run out of Tolkien to discuss, you know, uh, in your podcast. Do you have plans? Are you going to are you going to end it at some point? <laughs> and I was just kind of reflecting back on that this afternoon. And I'm like, oh, that's adorable, actually. Right. Um, yeah. No, that's not going to happen. Um, so, yeah. Yeah. This is um, <laughs> this is fantastic. So, um, yeah, we're not going to we're not going to run out of anything. Sorry, I'm trying to make sure my heat, my heater is on over here. It's freezing down in my little basement here. So, let us, without further ado, get into book one here. Um, quick announcements, just a, uh, just a quick reminder what I've been announcing, but it's important, our spring moot season, don't forget, Orlando moot, 23rd of March, uh, uh, down, uh, so this is the Sunshine Moot down in Orlando, and Nader Moot in the Netherlands on April 13th. Those are uh, two one-day uh, regional conferences, just like the other regional moots that we've been doing over the last year. And then, of course, the big one, Myth Moot, uh, in, uh, at, at the end of June. Really fun, um, uh, really fun thing I just learned this past week. I got a, I got a, I got a really cool email. So uh, Verlon Flieger is coming this year. Uh, we always love having Dr. Flieger when she's able to come. Um, uh, but she's planning to attend all of Mythmoot this year. So I'm, I'm really delighted to have her with us. Uh, she is one of those just wonderful, wonderful people. If you don't know her work, Verlin Flieger is one of the, you know, the, the, the three greatest Tolkien scholars uh, in the history of Tolkien scholarship. Um, uh, just one of the one of the one of the real cornerstones of the field, and uh, uh, such a wonderful person. A, a great, just a wonderful, wonderful opportunity uh, to get to meet and hang out with her. Uh, if you can come to uh, uh, to Mythmoot this year, so just wanted to just wanted to mention that because if it's not an inducement to you, it should be. Just wonderful opportunity. Um, so anyhow, just one that was that one little fun thing about Mythmoot uh, that I learned this year, uh, or this week rather. It, it was this year too. But every I wish I could say every week feels like a year. Rather, it's almost like the other way around. But anyway, let us move along. So uh, here's I, there is I, I said I was going to do the notes and queries at the end. Well, except for one. Because I mentioned it, I think last time I got this on uh, Twitter, and we didn't get a chance to talk about it. But I wanted to, uh, uh, I did want to uh, uh, to discuss it, and that is, I spent a while talking about Elbereth, but I didn't spend a while talking about Luthien. So Gamut Dorak was asking me about this on Twitter. Uh, said uh, I was I was wondering why Frodo with the Ford of Bruin in cantilated, and I love that verb by the way. It means like intoned, uh, basically. But I think. Cantillated technically means uh, to to think of uh, uh, associating the word cantillated with it uh, makes it sound like Frodo was there being like, "By Elbereth and Luthien the Fair, thou shalt ha have neither the ring nor me." You know, and that's not exactly what was happening. But anyway, nevertheless, it's a fun word. So he said. Um, he said, by Elbereth and Luthien the Fair to shoo the Ringwraith away. The combination of those two names is not very common. Um, what would have made Frodo recite their names? So, uh, great question. And uh, as I said, we talked a while about, for a while about Elbereth, and I was really focused on um, the question of we talked about, is this a vow that he's taking? We talked about um, what's the difference between this and when he drops the E-bomb under, weather, un under Weathertop. Um, my, uh, I believe pretty strongly that this is not a question of Frodo trying something that he tried before and it worked before and it doesn't work this time. I don't, I don't think that that's what's happening here. Um, because I think that, um, first of all, the circumstances are quite different. I don't mean the external circumstances. I mean with Frodo. When Frodo did it the first time, Frodo didn't do it, right? I mean, he found himself saying this. Um, that was that was somebody else was kind of driving the bus. Uh, Frodo didn't. He wasn't there. Like, hey, I've got a great plan. I'm gonna, you know, invoke Elbereth here. Um, so even the very action, even the invocation itself, was seemed to have been an intervention. Um, uh, presumably, I believe, on Elbereth's part. Um, so when he's making this kind of a declaration, right, 
by Elbereth and Lucy and Luthien and the Fair, he's doing something different. Um, my argument last time was that this was essentially a statement of faith on Frodo's part, right? That he is he is declaring, um, you know, in the future tense, this shall not happen, um, and he doesn't have the power himself to make it happen. He's not exactly calling upon Elbereth and Luthien to cause it to be, right? Um, he is calling them in witness to the statement that, you know, he is, he is invoking their names in conjunction with this, right? And in a sense, perhaps calling them as witness. But again, it's not a vow because he's not promising to do something, right? He's just, he is just calling them to witness this statement that he is making, right? This declaration, this faith statement, as it were. Um, now, um, the part, though, of that that I didn't ever really talk about was Luthien, right? Um, the Bielbereth makes all kinds of sense, right? Especially given what we saw under Weathertop. But what about Luthien? Um, and here's what I want to be careful with here. So there, there are a couple things. First, most importantly, we have to make sure that we stay in context here, right? That is, so far as we know, Frodo does not know the full story of Baron and Luthien, right? Um, he doesn't even know the full story. Therefore, what Frodo knows is what we've been told, right? What he's been told by Aragorn in the poem and then in the prose tale sort of summary, right, that Aragorn gives afterwards. Now, Cecilia, you're right. It seems a little bit in some ways odd, right, for him to, I mean, is he praying to Luthien, right? That would be weird, because she's not prayable, right? Uh, she's dead. <laughs> she left the world. That was kind of a big part of the story. And Tom, exactly, right? She died, right? That's pretty much... If, if, uh, if, if this were within Peter Jackson's film, that's all that he would know, right? She's this dead girl, right? That's, that's what... There's, there's nothing else, apparently. Um... Uh, Tom and I often laugh about that. The shortest version of the Baron and Luthien story ever told, right, was Peter Jackson's Aragorn saying she died. <laughs> right? That, that's it. That's the whole story. Um, um, so, Tony, exactly. We might be tempted, uh, you know, for very good reasons, right, to remember that she defeated Sauron himself, right, that she brought Sauron himself to submission, Frodo doesn't know that. Frodo's not heard that story, certainly not in that detail. Um, and remember, this would have been easier for the original audience who didn't have the Silmarillion at all, right? Uh, so the, your original, you know, your, your first generation reader of uh, The Fellowship of the Ring would only ever have heard of Luthien from that story that Aragorn told. Um, so let's, uh, so JJ, it's, I, I think it is in some ways like a Catholic invoking a saint, um, but it's not, I, I'm not sure it's exactly the same, but I do think that there is something of that spirit there. Um, but here's what I want to, here's what I want to do. Um, I want to look at the text. So I'm, I'm cheating here. We're not going to do slides. I'm going, because I want to scan over the text. Let's remind ourselves. What do we know about what does Frodo know about Luthien? So when he invokes Luthien, what do we have to go with, right? Um, uh, on like what her story means to Frodo, right? So you will remember we spent a lot of time right talking about um, uh, talking about the the um, uh, the the poem, right? So, and we remember. Nothing happens in the book. Like none of the adventures. The poem is really just about their meeting. It's only that very indirect last stanza, right? Long, long was the way that fate them bore o'er stony mountains, cold and gray, through iron, through halls of iron and darkling door, and woods of nightshade, morrowless. We don't. We're given no details there, right? She had a bunch of adventures in scary places is what we learn, right? That we don't, we don't get much in, 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 in the way of fact there. Um, the sundering seas between them, 
lay and yet at last they met once more again fairly vague right so we don't we, we don't know much about her career we don't know many details about her story we just know about her meeting with baron in his prose narrative of course he tells us a little bit more but notice here what he talks about so he begins by saying who she was, and he emphasizes her beauty. She was the fairest maiden that has ever been among all the children of this world. So he explains very clearly she is, you should associate great beauty, in fact, the greatest beauty ever with Luthien. So that's clearly one take home, right, that, um, that, uh, that Frodo has, uh, about Luthien. Uh, what else? Okay, well, then, so now he's telling the story of Barra here, right? Uh, and now he, go, he goes into the meeting of Baron and Luthien again, right? And calls her Tenuviel. Okay, fine. Many, bes- many sorrows befell them afterwards, and they were parted long. Tenuviel rescued Baron from the dungeons of Sauron. Okay, so she rescued him from the dungeons. That's, that sounds good. And they passed through many dangers together, and they cast down the great enemy from his throne. Okay, so we have we have those two things about her accomplishments, right? She rescued Baron from Sauron's dungeon, and she casts down even the great enemy from his throne. Okay, that's great. That's a big deal. But then Baron was slain, and he died in the arms of Tenuviel, but she chose mortality and to die from the world so that she might follow him. And it is sung that they met again beyond the Sundering Sea. So death and self-sacrifice are associated with with her as well, right? And that's what he spends most of the rest of his time. They they came again, right? They met again beyond the Sundering Seas, and after a brief time walking alive once more in the green woods, together they passed long ago beyond the confines of this world. Uh, Strider pays sort of surprisingly little attention to their resurrection, right? Not Kind of downplaying the whole resurrection thing, right? Um, and... Uh, uh, and then there live still those of whom uh, uh, Luthien was the foremother, right? So we get her her descendants there at that point. Um, so anyway, so there's um, uh, that's the sort of shape, right, of what he of what he emphasized. And there, there was another light, another uh, uh, a light reference. Yes, uh, as as the stars above the mists of the northern lands was her loveliness, and in her face was a shining light. Right. That sentence really, when I was coming, kind of coming back and rereading this section, thinking about Frodo's invocation at the ford, um, that sentence really jumped out to me. In part, of course, because that sent more than anything else, I think that sentence makes her a very logical kind of pair uh, with Elbereth. Right. Um, As the stars above the mists of the northern lands was her loveliness and in her face was a shining light. Um, Very Elbereth like, certainly. Right. Um, and think about those um, uh, similes, right, that Strider is drawing here in trying to capture, in order to try to give the Hobbit some sense of how radiant was her beauty, right? Um, these things, I would think, would be... Um, uh, these things. These things, I would think, would be very present to Frodo's mind, very poignant in particular to Frodo's mind um, in this moment, not just because of the enemy that he's facing, but because of the darkness and shadow that's surrounding him, right? Remember, everything is getting gray to him. Um, He is just about um, ready to cross over. Remember these these different boundaries, right, that he's uh, confronting that we've been talking about. Um, I wonder if that image of her brightness, right, the brightness of her beauty isn't something that he thinks of in this moment. Now, I agree um, that he is, um, that there is some issue, you know, Simon, as you're talking about that, uh, he realized that Aragorn's telling of the story of Baron and Luthien was effective under Weathertop, and so he's bringing it up to defy the ring rates. I think that that's possible. Um, but I think that that's possible, but I think that that would, that's, what do I want to say? A little clumsy. Um, what I mean by that is 
there's Aragorn's singing of the song about Baron and Luthien. Even if, even assuming that Frodo perceived the efficacy of that, right, against the Ringwraiths, that doesn't necessarily mean that merely invoking her name is going to mean anything, right? Um, it's, it's, not, it's not exactly the same thing. Do you see what I mean? Um, it's, it, it's nothing like in the way that Elbereth's name was used, right? Um, either, obviously, by Frodo under Weathertop, even when Gildor uses it, right? And remember the significance that Frodo attaches to it then. They spoke the name of Elbereth, he says, remember. Um, so, so I'm not quite sure that that's sort of enough. Because, um, see, exactly, Evil Dr. Ken in the story uh, kept the ringwraiths at bay before, right? Not just her name, right? Um, so anyway, my... my my point is, um, my point is that when I when I go over what Frodo knows about Luthien, right? What is she associated with? Is uh, she is associated with light and beauty, which is again I think important in this moment to him as the world is becoming dark and gray around him. Um, she is associated with not only defiance against darkness, but freedom from prison, right? She freed uh, Baron from, uh, from uh, Sauron's prison, which Aragorn emphasizes, right? So um, he is on the cusp of enslavement of more than one kind, right? As they're telling him that they're going to, you know, come back to Mordor, we will take you, they have just told him, right? And so he cites... He, he mentions Luthien, right, um, who is associated with escape from bondage, though he doesn't necessarily know that particular phrase. And Balang's bond, yeah, sacrifice. Um, that, to me, is the interesting thing, because of all of those things, you know, there's one or two sentences where he talks, where Aragorn talks about Luthien as standing up to darkness, Right. There's a few sentences there at the beginning where he talks about her brilliance and her beauty. But there's a long section where he talks about her death and her uh, submission to death. Um, So, yeah. And Kit, yeah, I'm not trying to argue that he's kind of reasoning it out and he's making a, you know, like a very well calculated quip here. Exactly. It's not something like that. Um what I'm trying to do is just sort of think at this point, right? Like if you were to sit Frodo down and say Luthien to him, what's his first reaction? What does he associate with Luthien the Fair, right? Beauty, obviously, as he calls her Luthien the Fair, right? Um, but what does that mean to him? Why is it that he... And this, this is how, that's how I would want to try to answer the question, why does he mention Luthien in this context? And, you know, kid, it may well be as simple as just... Those, you know, that name is in opposition to evil. But again, so were many, right? Um, uh, even uh, people th- th- whom he knows better, right? Like, why not invoke Gandalf, for instance? Um, but, um, yeah, Tony says he seems to be grasping at spiritual straws here. Yes, but again, see, that pairing of Luthien and Elbereth, though, that does not sound to me like an arbitrary pairing, right? Like, just... Let me throw out the names of the first two good guys I can think of, right? Um, the fact, for, first of all, the fact that they're both women seems to be an, uh, uncoincidental. Uh, the fact that he's calling out their name at this time of need uh, to, you know, look upon him as he is making his sort of statement of faith, that certainly is uh, de- definitely, and I forgot who was mentioning this before, that does have a, a, a sort of a Catholic invocation of saints uh, feel, Right. And um, he um, is. uh, And of course, the fact that they're both women also has a particularly Catholic feel right with the invocation of the Virgin Mary. Um, But um, anyway, yeah. Are they the most powerful ones he knows? Yeah, Tony, possibly, possibly. Um, but again, I'm not even sure it's about magnitude as much as as it is about quality. Again, if 
If you want to ask me what those two, th what those two figures have in common, again, especially in Frodo's mind, right? Given what we know Frodo knows, right? What are the two things that they have in common? My primary answer is uh, light, right? Light, light and beauty. Um, remember, that's what light and beauty was all what Gildor's song was, uh, Gildor et, et al., right? Um, that's what their song was that they, they heard, in the, that, the, that the hobbits heard in the Shire, the elves singing. And um, that's what he hears about Luthien as well. So if there's a, if there's a concept, yeah, it was JJ, thank you, Matt. Um, if, there's, if there's a core concept that he seems to be grabbing at here, that's what it seems to be. The bright and the beautiful, right? That which is bright and that which is beautiful. Um, and that's, again, that seems to me to fit under the circumstances. Um, there's, you know, and that which is bright and that which is beautiful is strong. But remember, this is going to be a thing. Remember, you know, remember Sam in, in Mordor, right? In The Return of the King, when he looks up and sees the star. It's a similar kind of... Um, uh, vision, right? A similar and and couched in similar terms. You know, there is there is light and high beauty, right? Uh, beyond the reach of the shadow. That's going to be the insight that Sam will have uh, round about the year twenty twenty nine. Um, so yeah, I mean that's um, you know that 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 seems to me very similar to the moment that Frodo is in here, and I think it's a it fits to me with this statement of, of faith that he's making. Because as the narrator has just said, he knows no reason why the Witch King is going to be able to cross as quickly as he... And his voice, he doesn't have the power of Bombadil, right? He can't command the Witch King to stop, and he will, right? Um, so Frodo is merely saying... Frodo knows no reason why he's not about to be enslaved here, right? Um, when he makes that statement, that's why, to me, it is primarily a statement of faith, right? And what he associates with, the, the, the figures that he names in conjunction with, right, as audience to or, or as witnesses to, um, as exemplars for this statement of faith, are those two figures of light and beauty. Um, with that element of self-sacrifice uh, in in uh, Luthien as well, which seems to me, um, uh, which seems to me relevant, um, they have both recently been mentioned in the text, Johannes. But like, so is Gilgalad, right? So is Baron for that matter. Why is Baron getting no love? Um, they're not the only ones. That those two are not the only ones, but certainly they have come up, right? Which is why this sentence makes any sense at all uh, to the readers, of course. Um, yeah, yeah. Okay, good. Um, and for Thonless, I agree that Sam's insight isn't about the resistance to the power of Mordor, but what it is about is about faith, right? Um, uh, he stops worrying when he sees the star and thinks about this. Um, and Frodo is in a place. It, he's, he, I'm not saying he's in exactly the same place or experiencing the same thing, um, but both of them, uh, both of them have uh, uh, sort of faith moments. I think in that uh, in that part. Um, Hrothgar is wondering if this confrontation has had occurred post Lorien, would Galadriel be invoked? Seems likely to me. I got to admit, um, seems very likely to me. Um, because of course she's gonna get invoked, in uh, uh, in some kind of interestingly similar ways. It'll be interesting to um, uh, to compare those actually. To be remembering this moment when we get to the invocations of Galadriel uh, in the two towers, uh, especially. But okay, um, and 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 the Return of the King as well. Um, yeah, <laughs> Boomful suggests by Tom Bombadil's boots and jacket, you shall not, you shall have neither the ring nor me. Yeah, absolutely. Um, yeah. Um, 
Yeah, well, Lilith, that's exactly what I'm going to be interested to see, to compare and contrast how they talk about Galadriel, whom they've personally met in the flesh, right, compared to Luthien, who is the subject of song, um, and Elbereth, who is also the subject of song and, even, and on a even totally different um, layer, right? Um, but, uh, yeah. Um, yeah, good. Exactly, Mad Violinist. Sam is going to invoke her explicitly more than once. Anyway, all right, so thank you, Gamma Dorok, for reminding me to have that discussion at the beginning here. So that was kind of finishing up the last slide, and now here we go. Then the leader, who is now half across the ford, stood up menacing in his stirrups and raised up his hand. Frodo was stricken dumb. He felt his tongue cleave to his mouth and his heart laboring. His sword broke and fell out of his shaking hand. The elf horse reared and snorted. The foremost of the black horses had almost set foot upon the shore. At that moment there came a roaring and a rushing, a noise of loud waters rolling many stones. Dimly, Frodo saw the river below him rise, and down along its course there came a plumed cavalry of waves. White flames seemed to Frodo to flicker on their crests, and he half fancied that he saw amid the water white riders upon white horses with frothing manes. The three riders that were still in the midst of the ford were overwhelmed. They disappeared, buried suddenly under angry foam. Those that were behind drew back in dismay. Okay. Um, so, what, uh, what are the main things that we notice here? First, we got to make sure that we give credit to the significance of this, uh, move by the Witch King, right? This is the Witch King, I think, at his most powerful that we have seen him. We've talked a lot about the Witch King's actions, um, and Saxo Grammaticus, we're going to come back to your comment on the Witch King's, uh, 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 actions, I hope before the end. Uh, if not, then definitely next time. But, um, focusing on that first paragraph here, the Witch King, who's still not named, right? He's just called the leader uh, of the Ringwraiths. He stands up in his stirrups and raises his hand. So notice the, con the, the results, the, the, the results of his action here. First, Frodo is stricken dumb. So Frodo can no longer speak. That is his response to Frodo's defiance, right? To Frodo's proclamation that they're going to have neither the ring nor him, right? Um, is to strike Frodo dumb. Frodo can't speak. He felt his tongue cleave to his mouth and his heart laboring, right? So he is... I suspect that the heart laboring, does this have to do something with the, the wound, right? Um, you know, I'm not sure. But anyway, his sword broke and fell out of his shaking hand. That's a big deal. Remember that this is, this is not just any sword, right? This is the sword which, um, this is the sword which it seems is, uh, um, uh, was this is the red flashing sword, right? The sword which was glowing red, uh, with a red burning white which seemed to be off putting to the ring wraiths in uh, un under Weathertop. Um, a sword wound with spells, yes, for the downfall of Angmar, right? Absolutely. Um, and it's so it's that sword, this Dunedain sword, um, which is set about with spells for his personal destruction that he overcomes and shatters. Right? It just spontaneously breaks and falls from Frodo's hand. On the one hand, that is... Um, and also, don't forget, I, to me, I think, most importantly, um, I think that this is a symbol of Frodo's resistance. Right, We've seen that twice now, both under Weathertop and on the horse before Asphaloth uh, started to Noro Lim, right? Uh, his drawing of his sword was his expression of defiance against the Witch King. Um, and that sword now shatters, uh, uh, shatters uh, and, and falls from his hand. Um, 
The elf horse reared and snorted. Uh, Asphaloth does not seem, you know, cowed, but he is affected by it, right? Um, and uh, the foremost of the black horses had almost set foot upon the shore. That's a really good question. Um, uh, sorry, who was that? Uh, Brandon was just asking, is the leader who is halfway across the river and the foremost who is almost upon the shore the same person? Um, it's possible since, of course, he has risen up, stood up menacing in his stirrups and raised up his hand that one of the other two has passed him. That's possible. I'm not sure if um, he is still in front. I would tend to think he's probably still uh, the one in the front. Um so I suspect, but we don't know for sure, that the Witch King is uh, the foremost of the black horses, is riding the foremost of the black horses. I suspect so. Um, yeah. Now, um, and good, Johannes, you're absolutely right. By having, by cleaving Frodo's tongue to his mouth, um, uh, the Witch King is also preventing him from calling on Elbereth, right? Notice that once again, someone else intervenes. <laughs> in Frodo's mouth, right? The first time it was uh, Elbereth, presumably, right? And he finds himself speaking words, you know, and invoking her name. Um, The second time it's the Witch King who acts on Frodo's mouth, right? And seals it closed. Um, Yeah. And you are... Right, Fourth Dallas, it is interesting that there are two cleavings that go on here, right? The word is only used the once, uh, but his tongue cleaves to his mouth and his sword is then cloven in, uh, uh, in, in pieces, right? Um, yes. Good. Rokoko was just saying that uh, she's not sure if it's relevant, but the barrel white sword also shatters to the hilt. Yeah, I do think that that's relevant. Certainly is a similar... Um, is a similar uh, 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 symbol, right? Uh, and we talked about that some in that uh, in that context. Um, but yeah, cleave, of course, is one of those wonderful words which means one thing and its opposite simultaneously, right? Cleave means either to take two things and fuse them together, or it means to take one thing and split it apart. Um, those are the two the two meanings of cleave, and they are opposites of each other. Uh, there are only a couple words like that in English that mean both one thing and its opposite. Um, splice would be another one, right? Um, uh, but anyway, uh, cleave is a, is a a popular one in this uh, in this regard. Um, so yeah, I, I do think that that's interesting. Um, Tony, I think that you are right to recall. Um, that uh, this is the first time we've seen Frodo come up against an evil agent that he cannot defeat no matter what he does. I agree that's one of the conclusions that I think that we can draw here, right? Uh, Frodo can't beat this guy. That's not happening. Um, Again, his insight is, you know, that he can't win. Um, He can't stop the Witch King from taking him. I mean, there is no rational reason for him to believe that he's going to be able to stop the Witch King from taking him. Now, we talked before, like, you could think he's got a head start and the faster horse, right, and, and, and all that. But again, when it comes to him versus the Witch King, when he makes that statement, you shall have neither the ring nor me, that's, that's, that's a statement of faith which does not seem to be obviously supported by fact at the time. Um, and we can see justification right, for doubt about that, right? Um, Yeah, yeah. Um, Yeah, good. Um, Yeah, good. Let's see. Um, Well, Finn, you're right. He was helpless to do anything about Old Man Willow. It's not the only time he's been helpless. Um... So, yeah, I guess in some sense you can say, you know, he's, uh, this should be a familiar place for him in one sense, right? Um, but, um, yeah, uh, Cecilia asks a great question. Why didn't the Witch King break the sword at Weathertop? Um, excellent question. Since we know that, obviously, he had the power to do this, why didn't he before? Well, first, he was surprised by the sword, 
right? He wasn't kind of thinking about that. He wasn't ready for that. Um, and he did seem to be a little taken aback by it. Mm-hmm. So exactly, Mike, I do think he was taken a little bit at, at, at unawares by it. But secondly, this is something like Endgame. Yeah, Penloth, exactly, because he didn't have to. Um, now, this is... Um, He's 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 leaving it all on the field right here. The Witch King is, I think. Um, uh, this is this is the time. Um, uh, yeah, and Tony says Frodo wasn't alone either, right? Perhaps because his uh, his attentions were dispersed, right? And the the power that the Witch King was putting forth was directed at more than just Frodo, possibly. Um, but even the whole, like, even the dramatic action, right, with which the Witch King enacts this uh, strike against Frodo, uh, standing up in his stirrups and raising uh, and raising his hand, um, this is diff- He's positioning himself differently. And I don't just mean physically, but um, he's holding himself differently with Frodo, right? This is a this is a different moment. He is claiming Frodo here. Um, that posture of raising up his hand, right? He is. He is ordering, he is commanding, he is taking charge of Frodo. The fact that he can seal his mouth like that, it seems, or at least to Frodo, it feels almost like, um, uh, almost like uh, his mouth has been physically sealed shut, right? The fact that he has that much control over Frodo um, shows that he is, um, their relationship is different now. Frodo was almost tricked Right. He only realizes afterwards that he was obeying the commanding will of his enemy. Right. Now, the Witch King is just dominating him directly in a way that he wasn't uh, before, I think. Um, Yeah. And Evil Dr. Cannon, I agree. Frodo is still resisting. He can't do anything. Right. There's nothing that he does, but he has not submitted, right? He's not given in. He's not coming. He's not responded to their calls. Come back, come back, right? He's not, he's not done that. Um, yeah, good. Yeah. Matt, I think that makes sense to me. Um, uh, he thinks that the, the witch King is acknowledging he's lost in a sense, a key battle to Frodo. He wanted Frodo to submit and Frodo defied him. Uh, now the Witch King will result to force rather than having him come back to Mordor with him voluntarily. Um, yeah, yeah. And Evil Dr. Khan and I agree, given how far gone he is, given how close to the edge Frodo is, um, it is very remarkable that he has the ability. Again, I go back to that that uh, thing that I was thinking about Gorfindel putting him on Asphaloth in the first place, right? That... Glorfindel himself seems to have a notion that Frodo's will is not going to be able to hold up to this confrontation should it come, right? Um, and so he wants to put it out of Frodo's power to go running off towards the Witch King, right? Um, but he, he, Evil Doctor Cannon, as you say, he doesn't, right? Um, he doesn't submit. Even now when he is being f- like physically and spiritually dominated, he doesn't give in yet. He doesn't answer. He doesn't, uh, he doesn't come to him. Um, yes, yes. Um, yeah, let's see. Um, yeah, the life, I do see the cleaving of the tongue and the breaking of the sword as being very similar in a sense that is robbing him of his weapons, right? Shut up and put the sword down, right, is how that's translated. Those are the two ways in which Frodo has defined him. The drawing of the sword and the speaking of his words are the two ways in which Frodo has defined him. Um, So, Matt, it is almost like both of those weapons are being slapped out of his hand, right? And again, as you say, that's when his goal was to convert Frodo, right, to to, to bring Frodo over uh, to him, to just have to smack him down is uh, a failure in some sense. Um, yeah. Um, and yeah, Captain Thunderheart, I do think the presence of Gorfindel matters here. Um, I'm not sure exactly the impact here. Um, 
because Glorfindel is coming up from behind right here, but how exactly that's going to impact him? Glorfindel says that he can't face all of the nine together, which they are now. All of the nine are together right there on the, at the ford. Um, but it does seem that he, I don't know, he's certainly taking forceful command of the situation, presumably, right, before uh, Gorfindel and the others uh, catch up. But, um, but yeah, I, I, I do think there's a certain amount of urgency here because presumably he does not want to leave Frodo still under his own power, right, while he turns to deal with the Elf Lord who's running up behind him. Um, yeah, yeah. And Evil Dr. Cannon, you're right. Uh, the Nazgul tactic usually involves taking a lot of time to instill fear. He does not have uh, the opportunity to stand there in the Ford creepily, you know, freaking out Frodo for like six hours, as we saw him do in Crick Hollow, or as we saw the Nazgul do in Crick Hollow. Um, yeah, that's not gonna, that's not gonna happen. Um, yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, and, and you're right. Gorfindel clearly does not fear them. So their primary weapon is not working. It seems fairly clear what they want is to take Frodo and go, to take Frodo and run. Um, but certainly, it doesn't want to leave Frodo on the loose uh, when Gorfindel catches up with them. Um, and Tony, you're right. We can't forget the hobbits, who have to be, I think a little unsettling to the Nazgul at this point, right? What are these freakish little surprisingly unintimidated <laughs> creatures, right? Who I really expected to be able to bring into line a lot easier than this. Um, yeah, yeah. Um, anyway, okay. Um, I... Um, I I do think the foremost of the black horses is ridden by the 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 witch king and I think that Asphalot's actions rearing and snorting is he afraid yeah he's responding to this the power of the witch king right the power that the witch king is 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 putting out I don't know I don't know horses well enough to know how to interpret that, right? Um, the rearing and the snorting. Under what circumstances do horses rear and snort? Can anyone tell me this? What if, if, if you had a horse that was rearing and snorting, not neighing, not, you know, screaming out in defiance, not, you know, uh, uh, screaming one of those, like, challenges that stallions will do. Um, what... Um, What's what's going on there? I'm not really I'm not really sure. Uh, so yeah, somebody somebody who knows horses can uh, can help explain that to me. Fear, maybe you think it's fear. I I I I, I can believe that. I can believe that. Uh, no reason to think that even Asphaloth doesn't feel fear here in this moment, right? I, I do think that it's different uh, from what we saw before, right? Before he was being defiant, the horse was right when Frodo first turns. Um, uh, but uh, but the 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 rearing and snorting, it's the snorting I think that uh, uh, strikes me as kind of interesting. Um, but um, yeah, it could be the behavior of a warhorse maven, right? It could be he could be fixing to fight, uh, especially as the other horse is coming towards him, right? Um, so he could be responding like so. So that's kind of fun, right? I kind of like that. Uh, if um, the Witch King is rising up and asserting his dominance over Frodo, and Asphaloth rears up and is asserting his dominance over the Witch King's horse, like yeah, you know, you and what horse, right, are coming over here? Um, yeah, maybe, maybe. Um, uh, but yeah, I don't know. I mean, he's an elf horse, right? Uh, I don't know that that means he's necessarily a war horse in, you know, the traditional sense. But, um, but yeah, we know that Gorfindel rode him into battle, so 
you know, obviously, uh, there's a certain amount of that there. He's a sport utility horse. Yeah, something like that, Penlaw, that's it. Um, yeah. Uh, Catriona, it does seem that just given the fact that he responds to it as he does, Asphaloth does seem to be within the area of effect, right, of uh, of the, the Witch King's imperious movements here, of, you know, of, of the, the power that he's putting forth. Um, uh, so, um, yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, Finn still votes for fear and uneasiness. I don't think the two things are... Um, uh, I don't think the two things are mutually exclusive, right? I think he could be feeling fear and a resolution to fight, right? As a, you know, he's in sort of fight or flight mode and has opted for fight, right? But it's still the fear response that he's, uh, um, that he's, uh, that he's responding to. Um, yeah, Crystal says when two stallions meet, it all starts with snorting, so it might be a challenge. Uh, yeah. <laughs> Ambrosius... Aurelianus uh, opines that um, uh, Asphaloth is invoking the names of Nahar and Shadowfax. So uh, that's, uh, yeah, I can go with that. I can go with that. Um, yeah, that's good. Okay, then the flood comes down. You notice what word is not used? <laughs> flood is not used. Um there came a roaring and a rushing. The, the, what Frodo experiences is sensation, right? He just hears something. A roaring and rushing sound, a noise of loud waters rolling many stones. Dimly, Frodo saw the water, the river below him rise, and along its course there came to plume cavalry of waves. Um... White flames seemed to flicker on their crests, and he half fancied that he saw amid the water white riders upon white horses with frothing manes. Yes, evil Dr. Kennedy only sees the river rising dimly. Frodo is not seeing very clearly. Um, here's another question I have. I wonder... I've often wondered this. Does anyone else see this? I mean, everyone is going to see the flood, but does anybody else see the white flames and the white riders upon white horses? Remember, Frodo can see the ringwraiths, too. Frodo is seeing the other side, right? Frodo is, can see, I mean, he's seeing the, the Nazgul. Um, he's going to see Gorfindel in a minute. Um, is Frodo seeing the power that is in this flood in ways that the others would not see? I mean, Merry and Pippin and Sam, are they just seeing a wall of water coming down? Are they seeing the horses and the fire too? Um, I wonder. Again, I don't, um, I don't know for sure. We don't really have any clear evidence. Um, it is true as James and uh, um, Trifle are both mentioning Gandalf's going to ask him about it. But Gandalf also knows where Frodo is, right? Um, yeah. Um, maybe. Now, Eternal Cow, I tend to agree with you. Gandalf's magic doesn't seem to be very selective like that. Um, yes, uh, Gandalf's magic has been of the, you know, fireworks sort most of the time that we've seen it, right? Or the, uh, you know, lightning flashing up from the hilltops on top of weather tops. So we know that Gandalf's magic is not usually invisible, right? Um, white flames, of course, thinking about the pyrotechnics with which Gandalf is so often as associated, that all seems easy enough to understand, right? Um, but, uh, but the life, exactly, I'm... St let me ask the same the same I, I agree with all that but I'd ask the same question a different way I wonder what one of Gandalf's fireworks displays would look like to Frodo right now right what would he see if he 
in his current state, right? So if somebody dragged the semi-comatose, half-blinded, uh, agonized, semi-conscious Frodo to a fireworks display, one of Gandalf's fireworks display, what would he see, right? Um, is he able to see stuff that he wouldn't normally see? Um, and... Uh, somebody was, uh, oh yeah, Tom was saying there's not much point in the horses if the others can't see them. Well, but that's what I'm wondering, right? What is the point of the horses? Um, I don't think the point of the horses is cosmetic. That is to say, it's not like they're trying to put on a show. I'm not trying to intimidate anybody. If there, if if Gandalf's goal in him assisting with the flood, right, were to make it look more impressive and more terrifying and intimidating than it is, like he would be trying to fool someone, right? In that case, um, he'd be bluffing in a sense. This isn't bluff, right? This is legitimately going to steamroll <laughs> the ringwraiths, all nine of them, right? Um, so the power that Gandalf is adding to the fort is not cosmetic. It's not superficial. It's, it's real. Right. Um, and so therefore, presumably it would be real whether or not it looked like horses or not. Right. Um, what would be the point of him making the, the waves look like horses? Are they going to hit harder, right? Are they, what's the, what's the point, uh, of those? Um, and you can't always just styling. Yeah, possibly, possibly. Um, I think it is an act of defiance. So, one question would be, can't the point be for it to look cool? Yeah, Karina, it could be. If not for the fact that Gandalf draws attention to it later on. If it didn't get explained, then it could just be to look cool, right? Um, but Bricktails, I tend to agree with you exactly there. Um, one of the main things that we see, uh, uh, why horses, of all things, Right? Why not, I don't know, giants stomping down? Why not, you know, lions, which there aren't any of in Middle-earth, as we discussed. When did we discuss this? I talked about this recently. I can't, no, it's some film, right? We talked about lions and how there aren't any lions. And no, it wasn't. It was uh, Druid's Fire. It was in our stream on Friday, right? When we were looking at the, at the rampant lions on the shields of folks in Lake Town. Um, absolutely. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, right after some film. Okay. Yeah. Anyhow, um, why not? But it could be something, right? It could be, could be wolves. It could be, I don't know, at hounds like Huan, right? Why horses, um, and horses with riders, Lincoln. Exactly. Why horses with riders? And there does seem, Bricktails, as you were suggesting, an obvious answer to that question. Because they're riding down the black riders, right? There are black riders on black horses standing in the ford, and the white riders on white horses are going to come and trample the heck out of them, right? That's, in fact, what we're going to see in the ford, and that seems pretty significant, right? And I think I wonder... Oliphant's Mad Violence, exactly. How impressive would that be, right? Um, <laughs> Bruneer was thinking the same thing. Um, or swans, dragons, you know, all sorts of things. Um, yeah, I... I <laughs> swans? You guys are, are thumbs up on stage. Gandalf, it should have been swans. Um, <laughs> hippos. <laughs> anyway, um, I think that it's... Uh, and... Rococo points out that uh, it is funny that we just discovered, uh, we discussed Asphaloth's spurt of speed like a flash of white fire, right? And we get, um, we get white fire, of course, also there with the white horses and white riders. 
I'm coming back around here to my for my question, which is if there is a visible change, why? Why? Um, Because, again, it's not you're not bluffing somebody. You're not trying to scare them. You're not trying to impress them. You're not trying to intimidate them. You're trying to stomp them. Right. With um, uh, with the with the waves, with the with the flood here. So. um, Why spend the power sculpting white horses on white riders? I think the answer has to be. That it's, I, if it's visible, to, I mean, generally, not just a Frodo uh, in his weird state, um, but to everybody, if it's, if it's publicly visible, I feel like there has to be a reason for that. And the primary reason I can think of um, is, as Penlon says, psych- psychological warfare. Yeah, but I'm not sure that the target audience of the White Horses and the White Riders is necessarily the Black Riders, right? I think it could very well be um, the uh, the people on the shore, right? Frodo and the rest of the hobbits and stuff. Um, as above, so below, Cat. Uh, the physical respects reflects the, the spiritual, possibly. Possibly. It could just be a kind of a natural outflowing of it, right? But James, that's what I'm thinking, that it's a, that it's a form of encouragement, right? Um, Gandalf and Elrond will know that the primary thing that they need, remember, from the beginning with the ring wraiths, it's all about the spiritual warfare. It's all about the spiritual warfare, has been, right? And we've seen the emphasis on that ever since Weathertop, right? What those who are there confronting, those who are on the scene uh, near the Black Riders are going to need most is hope, right? Hope. The cavalry has arrived, Boomful. That's exactly the message, right, uh, that Gandalf would be sending. Don't fear the Black Riders, because the White Riders with white horses, right, are, are here, right? Um, you are not alone. You are be- you're not just being saved by some fluke, right? You are being rescued. Um, you are not alone. Uh, and here comes the power of light and goodness and beauty uh, right against the uh, against the Black Riders. Um, yeah. Interesting. Tony says it could be um, um, it could be that uh, Sauron also is, in a sense, an audience uh, that, you know, he, he knows he's got to up his game after this. Maybe. Maybe indirectly, right? I mean, it would be sort of a message to the Black Riders themselves, right? Um, yeah. Yeah. Um, <laughs> reference to Bilbo's riddle. Yeah. Were, were there 30 white horses, though? I'm not sure. Um, yeah, exactly. Yeah. Um, Blue Wizard says, the feeling of dismay in the last sentence implies more than just a physical fear uh, or reaction. Um, yeah, yeah. Um, those that were, that were behind drew back in dismay. They are, they are dismayed, right? And I think it's not just by the rush of water, right? Um, I, yeah, I think that they perceive the power that is being unleashed against them here. Um, yeah, good. Um, okay. Uh, yeah, good. Um, <laughs> <laughs> Life is suggesting this the spin-off movie of the other twenty-one horses and the watchful piece. Yeah. Where were the other twenty-one horses at the time? Um Okay, good. Let's see. What else? Uh right, cavalry, of course, is a word that's mentioned. So again, that sense of 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 uh, of the mighty charge, right? Of the rescue. Sure. Um and the three riders are just overwhelmed. Uh, I, I notice here there is um, notice the shift from the last paragraph to this one, right? In the last paragraph, we saw the witch king in the the most intimidating he has been, right? Um, he just 
he just broke Frodo's magic sword in his hand, right? He just sundered it. Um, this is really impressive, right? He has exerted, and, and, and Matt, I still, I, I agree with you. He's also kind of lost, right, that he has to do this. But again, he's kind of boss right here, the Witch King is, right? And then immediately, after having his big boss moment, he then has a Captain Ahab moment, right? Um, and by Captain Ahab moment, I'm referring spoilers to the end of Moby Dick. Moby, Captain Ahab doesn't win. Moby Dick, right? Book's been around for a while. You've had your chance to read it. Um, but the 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 great thing, I love the end of Moby Dick. Um, Captain Ahab spends a long time building up this conflict, right? Building up his own power and his own defiance against the whale and what he's going to do and, and everything else. And then in the end, it's just like, boom, it's over instantly. He just, just gets yanked below the water and is gone. There's no fight. There's no conflict. And you see that Captain Ahab was fooling himself all along, right? We get almost that same kind of moment, right? The Witch King rises up in his boss moment and he's raising his hand and he's breaking the sword and then boom! He's just, without even being named, right? He's just overwhelmed. He just disappears, buried suddenly under angry foam, right? He's just gone. Uh, and uh, that's um, pretty cool. <laughs> right. Uh, this is a, uh, uh, that's a, a nice, uh, a nice moment. And yet Archimago, you're right. He doesn't even, uh, uh, the Witch King do doesn't even get a Wrath of Khan speech. Uh, as those of you don't know, that speech that Khan makes before he blows himself up is almost word for word from Moby Dick. Um, uh, but, um, but yeah, Eternal Cow, I agree. Angry foam is a really wonderful, uh, phrase there. Um, Rococo, I, I think it likely that we are supposed to remember Pharaoh and the Red Sea. That seems um, apropos. Definitely. Definitely. Um, yeah. Yeah. Um, it's foamily angry. <laughs> yes. Yes. Um, yeah, very good. Um Let's see. Fourth Dauntless is asking if Tolkien could here be accused of a deus ex machina. No. Uh, see, again... It's interesting. I find that a lot of modern readers start calling deus ex machina any time something like a eucatastrophe happens, right? There's a big difference between eucatastrophe, a sudden miraculous turn, and a deus ex machina. Deus ex machina is when a god descends and just... So, when Sam wakes up in the field of Cormallon and asks, is, every, you know, is, is everything sad going to come untrue? Right? Um, is every bad thing that happened going to just reverse itself miraculously? Right? What Sam is asking is, are we having a deus ex machina here? <laughs> Right. And it turns out, no, Frodo still has a stumped finger. Right. It's, no, the bad things that have happened have still happened. And of course, we see in Frodo's continuing state that the set the that the, the, you can't just undo it. Right. It hasn't been undone. Um, but uh, that's what. A de okay. So a deus ex machina is when basically, uh, you know, like a writer is like written himself into a corner and then he just like does something to just fix everything. Right. And just, and, and it does violence to like violence to the characters, violence to the, to the, uh, you know, to, to the direction the characters were developing violence to the plot, the theme, right. We're just going to be like, and now all of a sudden everybody is better and uh, everything is fine. Um, that's the kind of thing that, uh, uh, is a deus ex machina, right? So a sudden shock, the eucatastrophe, right? The sudden turn, which brings about an unexpected and happy resolution, isn't a deus ex machina. That's, it fits. It's part of the, um, um, it's part of the, uh, uh, it's, it's part of this world. It's, it's a native part of this world, right? And it's true that it's unexplained at this point, Right. I mean, it's completely out of nowhere as far as Frodo knows. Right. 
But it will soon be explained, and we will see how it is a native part of this world, and how, in fact, um, again, remember, this lends new significance to that race to the Ford, right? And that crossing of the boundary that we discussed. It turns out that by crossing the boundary, Frodo has won, right? Um, Frodo didn't look safe when he crossed the boundary, right? He didn't feel safe when he'd crossed the boundary, but it turns out that he was, right? Um, he didn't know it yet. We didn't know it yet, but it turns out to be so. Um, yeah, yeah. Um, anyway, okay. Um, let's see. Hey, I know. Let's do the, let's do the last slide. We'll leave the angry foam. Um, with his last failing senses, Frodo heard cries, and it seemed to him that he saw, beyond the riders that hesitated on the shore, a shining figure of white light, and behind it ran small shadowy forms waving flames that flared red in the gray mist that was falling over the world. The black horses were filled with madness, and leaping forward in terror, they bore their riders into the rushing flood. Their piercing cries were drowned in the, in the roaring of the river as it carried them away. Then Frodo felt himself falling, and the roaring and confusion seemed to rise and engulf him together with his enemies. He heard and saw no more. End of book one! But now we still have to talk about it. Okay. Um... Uh, okay, so what I would emphasize about that first paragraph, the thing that jumps at me primarily here is the tenuousness of the description, right? With his last failing, sen Frodo's senses are failing. He is going under here. And what he sees, he is not at all sure of what he sees. Right? It seemed to him that he saw these things, right? Um, uh, it seemed to him that he saw these things. Um, what does he see? A shining figure of white light. We know who that is, right? He could see that before uh, the white light shining through the form and raiment of the rider, as we discussed. So he is seeing the spiritual presence of Gorfindel here, right? Um, And he sees his friends, small shadowy forms, waving flames. Strider too? Is Strider one of the small shadowy forms? I would suppose so. Um, yeah. Um, waving flames that flared red in the gray mist that was falling over the world. Um, that seems to me an interesting thing. Remember... Strider insisting that fire was a defense against the ringwraiths, right? He is seeing... This is not just... It's looking... It's dark, and so the, the flames are a light source, right? Um, you know, shining bright light in a radius of 30 feet. Um, yeah, exactly, uh, 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 Balrogs. This is... that. The, the, it sounds like the fire is partly in the spirit world. He's seeing primarily in the spirit world here. Um, he's seeing like a ringwraith, right? Their forms cast shadows in their minds, uh, Aragorn said of them, right? Um, and uh, uh, they and and so that that's what he's seeing here. He can only see his friends as shadows. And yeah, I, I, too old not to. Um, they're, they all look small because they're they're still relatively far away, I suspect. So even Aragorn would look uh, like a uh, small shadowy form from where he is. Um, but um, yeah, the, you know, thinking about fire and the flame imperishable and all that kind of thing, sure, there's all kinds of interesting flames to see here. Um, Archimago is interested in the colors white, red, gray, and black, um, suggesting Frodo's diminishing perception, only seeing the, the broad brushstrokes of the world, in fact, seeing almost no color at all. The only color 
that he sees is the fire, right? The redness of the fire is the only color in the entire scene. Um, so why does fire have some kind of spiritual existence? I don't know, but it's interesting, right? Um, and certainly helps us to understand why Aragorn was so insistent on his campfire. Um, Cecilia, I agree it's important that he can see his friends, though I wonder, um, can he? I mean, yeah, he can. Those are his friends that he's seeing, right? But, um... A shadow was falling between him and his friends before. He's not aware that it's his friend. I, the description of his friends as small, shadowy forms waving flames, right? He doesn't seem to realize that. It's not like that he's looking at them and he's being like, oh, it's Mary and Pippin and Sam, but no, they just kind of look sort of shadowy, right? There's no, based on this description, there's no acknowledgement even of who they are, right? Um they're just small shadowy forms. That's all that he can see. That's all that he seems to be able to think, right? Um, yeah, yeah. Um, <laughs> Hrothgar's not quite so bad as that. Hrothgar is remembering a famous, uh, uh, a famous session play in Lotro when you play the the discussion at Parth Galen from Boromir's point of view, uh, and uh, the Merry and Pippin are are called uh, are, are are called Hobbit and other Hobbit uh, is is the 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 names that are put above them. It's a, a very comical move and uh, a sort of uh, I, I think it's unjust to Boromir, but uh, nevertheless, it's still funny. Um, but um, anyway, yeah. Uh, I agree. Fire, you know, we should keep an eye on that to uh, uh, be thinking about fire. This certainly draws our attention to fire in a really interesting way, right? So we'll have to um, um, we'll have to to fall back from uh, uh, and 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 think about that more as we as we go through um, references to to uh, uh, to to fire. Yeah. Anyway. Um, right, JJ, I agree. It's reflecting Boromir's state of mind at the time. Yes, yes. Um, yeah. Trifle, I've always thought that labeling, the label over Sam, uh, which reads, uh, uh, Frodo's servant, is kind of a dig at this, at the Silmarillion summary of the Lord of the Rings, right? Fr uh, Frodo of the Shire alone with his servant, right? Um, but anyway... Yeah, Hrothgar is saying that, uh, is wondering whether he's seeing actual fire or possibly seeing the barrel blades. I think it's interesting that they haven't seemed to have drawn their swords. Um, it makes me wonder if, uh, um, it makes me wonder if Aragorn knows about the swords. Or Gorfindel has noticed, right? He's been busy, right? He's been focused on other things. Do they know that you know, they have anti-wraith swords, uh, the three of them, right? That would seem like it would be kind of handy. Um, yeah, Trifle, I, I agree. It's definitely real fire that they're seeing here. But it's interesting to me that we're not seeing their swords. Um, but, uh, yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, good. Anyway, um... Yeah, they did stop to light firebrands. Uh, Gandalf's gonna, we're gonna uh, hear that explanation, which is an interesting thing by itself, right? Um, but yeah, that 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 definitely did happen. We will learn about that. Um, no, Cor I don't think we ever got total confirmation that Mary's sword isn't the only specially anti-witch king sword. Again, we have good reason to think that uh, Frodo, um, Frodo's sword was similar, right? And so given, uh, with the fla you know, red flashes and stuff that we got from it, um, seems likely that they're similar. Um, and then um, we, we know that Mary's sword was wound about with spells. Uh, so there's every reason to think that Pippin's and Sam's were as well. Because um, uh, they all came from the same place. Okay. We'll come back to some of that stuff later on. 
The black horses were filled with madness. How? Why, do you think? Why were the black horses filled with madness? I mean, scared of fire? Scared of Glorfindel? Is it Glorfindel scaring the horses? Why? Why are the horses scared of Glorfindel? They're not seeing him as the... They're not seeing a shining figure of white light headed towards them, presumably. Maybe horses can see into the spirit world as well. Might explain a lot. Um, but um, Penloth is saying because of the 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 white horses with white riders in the river, right? They'd be freaked out about the river. That I can easily imagine, right? Um, Mad violinist, I agree. There's a lot happening that would freak out any ordinary horse here. Um, they're trapped between flood and fire, right? Um, so they would be terrified, right? Um, they've just seen three of their companions, the horse, you know, the three other horses, right? No matter what they think about the, uh, the ring wraiths themselves, we know that, um, you know, horses are herd animals. And so those nine horses that have been traveling together will have just lost three of their number. Right. Um, yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, the Mad Violinist is suggesting that if the riders themselves are spooked, that would communi that would uh, communicate to the horses. Um, yeah, possibly. Possibly. I have to admit, I am... Um, uh, I had... Um, never been comfortable with the idea of Glorfindel drowning the horses. You know? Glorfindel coming up with the design of driving the horses to their deaths in the ford. I mean, I mean, I get that, like, taking out the ring wraiths is important here. Um, but, um, <laughs> yeah, Tom, that is a nice image, isn't it, of the ring wraiths being spooked, right? Yeah. Um, they are maddened such that they leap forward and bear their riders into the rushing flood. You would think that that would be the last thing that they would do, right? Um, but, um, yeah, Trifle, I know he can't exactly ask the Nazgul to dismount, um, but, um, uh, but yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, exactly. Their horses are stricken with madness, as Gandalf is going to explain. It is hard not to think forward to Gandalf's explanation in the next chapter, right? Um, I do, I'm, I, I'm trying to stick to just the text as we're given it here, um, but given that all this is explained in the next chapter, you know, the next scene, really, it's uh, it's hard not to be thinking about that. Um, but the madness, I think, you know, they're not just the horses are not just startled, right? They're not um, they're not merely afraid. Uh, they're filled with madness, and so when they throw themselves into the river, they're not really uh, fully um, uh, cognizant of what's going on, right? Um, so, Carita, this may, I don't know if you're still with me, uh, here tonight, Carita, but, uh, Carita has been noticing how heroic the horses are and how, um, everything works out well for the horses so far in the Lord of the Rings, uh, as if to make up for the great mortality of ponies, uh, in The Hobbit. Uh, and, uh, yeah, this, um... Uh, this definitely is, uh, the, 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 the first slipping of that, right? Um, uh, it's the first time horses have been, uh, uh, have been, uh, uh, damaged in the making of this story. Um, yeah. <laughs> Mad Violinus points out that the, the, uh, uh, the Witch King gets three steeds taken out from under him. Yes. Yes. Um, that's true, Bruinier. Bruinier points out that although ponies might do much better in the Lord of the Rings, horses actually don't fare all that well, right? Uh, not only do we have the ring wraith horses, we're going to get snow mane, right, and everything else. Um, yeah, yeah. 
Um, yeah, and Matt, I think that's an interesting point. Matt points out that it's interesting that Frodo, who can only see his friends as shadowy shapes and doesn't even think of them as his friends, can see the horses, right? Um, both the sight and the sound, their piercing cries, which I... No, wait, that's probably not the horses. That's the Nazgul, right? The riders would be the last antecedent for there, right? So the Nazgul, probably the one crying piercingly. Um <laughs> Tom is speculating that the ponies had unionized after the Hobbit came out. So, uh, yeah, their <laughs> representatives were making sure that things panned out a little bit differently in the Lord of the Rings. Um, yeah, yeah. Um, I do agree, son of Saradoc, with you and Lalith. Um, that uh, that last image of Frodo is really compelling, isn't it? Frodo felt himself falling, and the roaring and confusion seemed to rise and engulf him together with his enemies. He heard and saw no more. That sense in which um, uh, that sense in which Kimber, I agree, it does sound like it, it's it's almost like a cliffhanger, right? Does Frodo drown here? It kind of sounds like he got wiped away in the flood. Um, but um, but even more than that, remember all the stuff that we've been looking at in this chapter as this chapter has progressed speedily, more speedily than our discussion towards the Ford um, and all that boundary approaching and boundary crossing, right? And that question was, is he going to get to the boundary of Rivendell before he crosses the uh, boundary into the Wraith world, right? Before he loses his own life, right? His own full life and will. Um, and so the fact that he is lumped together with the wraiths here is in that sense doubly ominous, right? It's not only a cliffhanger in the sense of like, did he drown or not? Um, but you know, is he, how, how together with his enemies is he, right? Um, we, we saw already that he was with them, that he was similar to them, um, that he was seeing things on their side and like them. Um, yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, exactly. No, I, I agree. I think that this is, uh, uh, you're right. It's not quite as much of a cliffhanger as the end of the two towers. No question. Um, but, um, yeah. Arden Cran says, when I first read this part as a kid, I had to keep going even though it was past my bedtime. Yeah, it's definitely a cliffhanger -y kind of ending. There's no there's no question. Um, and uh, for Thoughtless, I agree. He certainly he certainly is. Um, he certainly is fainting. Right. Um, that's definitely that's definitely what what happens there. Right. Um, but. And because I, I think the roaring and the confusion that is engulfed, that is rising and engulfing him, it's not the act. I don't think he's falling into the water, right? It's not the actual flood uh, that's engulfing him. Um, it is, you know, he's he is losing his uh, uh, his his consciousness here. Um, but um, he heard and saw no more. Um, the last thing we get is the description of what he feels and what he hears. He doesn't see anything else. After the riders are borne forward into the rushing flood, he was not seeing anything particularly clearly, although, as Matt points out, maybe the maddened horses he's seeing clearly. Um, but um, but that, sense of, that sense of falling, that sense of drowning, that's also, that also works as a metaphor for his falling into the wraith world, right? For him, him losing himself. Uh, and that's, you know, I think one of the things that we can, um, one of the things that we can see happening here, to me, the bigger suspense, right, is not did he drown or not, but is he, is he gone, right? Has he, is it too late? Um, has the wound overcome him at last? Um, Hrothgar is also suspecting some kind of sympathetic connection to the Witch King due to the Morgul blade splinter. 
possibly. I mean, you'd think that if the Witch King got leveled here, right, that uh, uh, Frodo would be liberated by that. Um, but, um, but yeah, Archimago points out that we get uh, um, uh, falling twice, right? First, the gray mist is falling over the world at the end of that first paragraph there, and then Frodo him feels himself falling as well. So, um, so Archimago, yeah, if he's falling like the gray mist fell to descend upon the world, that's not good. That's not good either, right? Definitely not good. Um, yeah, yeah. Uh, Iwin Dillian says it's how it... Uh, uh, how it feels to go under anesthesia in some ways. Yeah, I can, I can, I can sort of see that parallel. Um, belongs among says it's almost, uh, as if the, the old Frodo from the Shire dies and the Frodo that eventually goes into the West is born when he wakes again. Um, yeah, well, we'll think about that for next time when Frodo wakes up, you know, what he has passed through and let's not lose sight of the, I mean, there's also, this is water we're talking about, right? There's something a little bit um, baptismal like this, which is also associated with death, right? And here I can't help thinking about uh, Dracula too, uh, and that all that sinking below water and drowning imagery, which is associated with that loss of self and um, and even with death itself uh, in Dracula. Again, that kind of, so yes... So, Belongsmont, it's true that baptism is about renewal, but it's about death. For, like, the immersion is about death, right? The coming up out of the water is about renewal, but the, um, uh, the, the, the submersion, um, the submersion is about the death, right? The death of the old self, uh, symbolically, is, of course, what's going on there in baptism. Um, but, of course, the question... And again, I think the reason, the other reason that I'm thinking of Dracula here is the way in which Bram Stoker depicts the vampiric state as this very explicitly anti-Christian, anti-baptism, right? I mean, the, the baptismal imagery uh, and th that language is used very explicitly. Um, uh, and again, so it's, it's, it's like redemption, it's like baptism, it's like salvation, except it's the opposite, right? Um, with... Um, uh, with Frodo here, there's that same question, right? I mean, is he losing, is the old, the old self dying and emerging as a new creature could be really bad for Frodo here, right? Um, uh, if he, um, uh, if he moves into the Wraith world, right? Um, if he, because uh, again, it's, there is a similar it's it's it, it, it's not as I mean he doesn't suggest it it, it doesn't um, uh, Tolkien doesn't use that vocabulary so I'm not I'm not trying to import that uh, into his text directly and stuff but again what do um, uh, uh, what do the ringwraiths find right everlasting life right uh, immortality is what they want um, uh, you know they want to 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 uh, drink of the waters of life and never thirst again. Um, and they get it, except warped and twisted and dominated and enslaved, which again, is, is that going to be when Frodo's head comes up above the metaphorical water again? What's it going to be, right? Is he going to be renewed in a positive way or is he going to be renewed in this hideous mocking way, right? Um, that's, uh, um, yeah, that's, that's, I think one of the, to me, that's the biggest cliffhanger that we're left with here. A spiritual cliffhanger. Well, I think exactly, exactly. He's gone under. Who's he going to be when he comes up, right? We have one hint about that, right? Our hint about that is... By Elbereth and Luthien the Fair, you shall have neither the ring nor me, right? That is the, uh, we have to, as we come to the end of book one here, uh, and stop, because we're totally going to stop, um, when we get to that point, the only thing we have is faith, 
in Frodo's statement of faith, right? And just as Frodo didn't see how he was going to stop the ring wraiths from taking him, so we don't see how Frodo is going to come up out of this roaring and confusion that has risen and engulfed him, right? Um, he heard and saw no more. That's, I mean, on the one hand, that's a nice description of passing out, right? But the emphasis on the negative there, right? Um, he did not hear or see anything, you know, that he, he has just lost those things. And the way in which that seems ominously like the end progression of what we've been noticing already, how his senses have been dulled and the shadow, the gray mist is falling and the shadows are coming between him and his friends. And now he hears and sees nothing. Um, so again, all we have to go on is by Elberth and Lithian the Fair, you shall have neither the ring nor me. Um, yeah. Okay. Um, all right. And that's it. Um, yeah, strong parallels with Pippin at the end of book five. Cat, I agree. Yeah, yeah. We're going to get... Um, if, you, if you think about it, Cat, you're completely right that a surprising number, a surprising percentage of the books of the of the of the the the, the Lord of the Rings end with a Hobbit cliffhanger, right? Yeah. Um, okay, we did it. We are done with book one. Next time we will start book two. But first, we're going to answer some questions. So I'm not promising we're going to get real far in book two next time. Uh, but we're gonna we're gonna start it. So. Um, Keep in mind, uh, we're going we're gonna to do a field trip now. But before we go on our field trip, we do have, um, uh, I'm, we're not going to be able to have class next week. Okay, so, so I'm going to be away next week. My family and I are going to go out to Arizona visiting my, my in-laws again. It's winter break for, uh, my, our kids are off from school. So we're going to grandma's house in Arizona next week where uh, my internet connection and my uh ability to have a class in a quiet room are a good deal more um, uh, uh, uncertain. So so we're not going to do um, we're, we're not going to do class next week but we'll be back the week after uh, so in uh, in March, first Tuesday in March March 5th, yeah, I think 5th, 4th, something like that um, we will be <laughs> We, we will be back then. So thanks, everybody. Uh, we're going we're gonna to do a field trip now, so I'm going to say goodbye to the folks on Twitter as always. Thanks for joining us. And uh, you can come over with us on twitch.tv slash SignumU if you want to join us for the field trip. Good night, everybody there. All right. And yeah, We did it, sir. We Yay. did it. Absolutely. See hi. I told you we were going to get through it tonight. I wasn't ever worried. I never right. doubted you. I, I, I look know. forward to the next 10 years with you, sir. Absolutely. <laughs> Absolutely. We're good. Yeah, the idea that we still have, like, fully 12 years left. Now, that might not seem proportionally to play, but, of course, this is why Evil Dr. Cannon actually did the math, right? Because, of course, that two years contains... Uh, you know, are galloping through the first couple chapters in, uh, 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 frankly, indefensible form, right? So, um, um, <laughs> little did we know in those days. Yeah, exactly. So, so the pace. Yeah. Uh, uh, it's, no, my, my daughter's been joking. Are you looking forward to your next year on the Council of Elrond? Oh man, yeah, it's um, <laughs> it's going to be. We spent seventeen class sessions on chapter 12. The Flight to the Ford took us 17 class sessions, which is... 17. The most of any chapter by far. Um, I don't know how many, many, many meetings will take us. There is the uh, Aaron Tree poem in that one. So, you know... Oh, yes. Uh, I don't think we're going to hustle through <laughs> many meetings. But then, yeah, yeah. Um, well... According to Evil Dr. Cannon's math, we're going at about a page a session-ish. Averaging about a page per session. 
Um, and the Council of Elrond is like 50 sessions, so it's going to be a good year. Easily a good year. Mm-hmm. Um, so, um, anyway. All uh, right. I, yeah, yeah. <laughs> That's the plan. Not to get into it. It's yep. going to be awesome. Um, okay, so... We're gonna we're gonna head to Rivendell because we finished book one and Frodo's gonna wake up in Rivendell and we're gonna head out to Rivendell. So, um, I uh, and we can t- and this is exciting. We can take the stables to Rivendell. Mm-hmm. I, I think, except probably not on the server because I I, uh, I I might not have Mithril sure. on the server. So yeah, let's 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 head out to Rivendell. We can start from the stable master. Um, okay. But, yeah, it's always the question of what do I have on the server, honestly. Yeah, I don't think I... I, I just rolled this character today, too, so it doesn't right. help. Eventually, I hope to have a Valoria on every server, just to avoid confusion. Yeah. took me this long to get this one, though. Let me... Regular spelling was taken, too. That was fun. <laughs> so I want to go to... I guess I could get on my horse. Theoretically. Mm-hmm. I'm just hoping my internet doesn't get too hinky. We got snow and ice storm going. Oh. Uh, man, if once I again, cut out suddenly, that's why. You guys down in Virginia getting way more snow than we're getting. We, 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 we got a little bit of snow. Yeah, no, weekend. that's what's happening. That's what's happening. All, the, all that stuff, the stuff we're getting is supposed to be up in the North Pole right now. Yeah. yeah. But it's got split into three pieces. Well, worst case, you're all stuck with me. Right. <laughs> We've already had first winter. What about second winter? <laughs> Don't think he knows about second winter, Pep. <laughs> Okay, let's see. Here's the moment of what truth about here. What timber? Slush tober. What can I do for you? Okay, can I... G- oh, look at that. I do have Rivendell open here. Yeehaw. You just gonna ride out there? I'm just gonna ride out there. I'm gonna, I'm gonna, okay. quick, gonna quick travel to Rivendell. Because we have now, like, galloped the road from Bree practically to Rivendell. What, like a yes. dozen times? Mm-hmm. Yeah, no, I'm glad I rolled a hunter this time. <laughs> I will say that much. All right. So this is where we ended up last time on purpose so that we can start here this time. So we'll, we'll wait on for purpose. some people to arrive here. Mm-hmm. Okay. Oh, boy, turning my graphics down. Are you lying? Uh, you just a little. Okay. So let's see. What do we notice here at the stables? Are the elves There's here? certainly not enough for our city. Right. A rather famous horse. Yes, the the yes. famous horse. I'm looking at the the livery of this sergeant at arms here. Don't click on the horse with the horse thing over his head. <laughs> You're yeah. gonna go bye bye. Wait, which one? Never mind. Um, the one I'm, to. I'm, I'm looking at this guy first. What does he got? Those are leaves, and are those snakes or just vines? Watch out for snakes. And and so these are not the same as the sort of tunics that the elves by the bridge were wearing, right? No. Yeah. It is something quite other. Hmm. Yeah, it looks like an eagle or something. Is there an eagle there? Uh, no, it's not an eagle. It's a... Uh, sorry, graphics again. It is a intertwined leaf, but it's not symmetrical. N- no, it's not symmetrical. The leaves aren't symmetrical. I'm mm-hmm. just trying to figure out if those are... Like snake heads, swan heads are not actually heads of. Pretty creatures. sure it's I mean, leaves. It looks like some kind of well, green yeah, wire no, or something. No, the, the leaves. It's the, the bit next to the leaves. 
Probably egrets, because it's a theme all over the place. Egrets? Egrets. Like over on the wall here? The beak doesn't look very egret-ish. The crown looks very similar, though. Maybe it's mm. a, the crest is laid back a little bit. With the crown... Oh, the crown up... That's a crown up there? Well, the crest on the top of the bird's head right, looks like right. the ones here over here on the walls by your hair. Uh-huh. Over here? Yeah. yeah, hiding behind the tree. Oh. These Oh, guys. yes, 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 yes. Oh, yeah, those I see. Yeah, kind of phoenix-looking things. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I like them. Don't know why. Yeah, yeah see, and there's that there's that repeated gold vine thing. Yeah, the motif. Yeah, gold vine thing, both above and below. Yeah, sure. Yeah, if you hadn't told me they were egrets, I totally would have thought they were phoenixes or something similar. They do look like phoenixes, but I can... Um... Like traditional Eastern depiction. Their crests look like egrets. That's mm -hmm. how you can tell they're not swans because of the crests they have there on the top of their heads. Yeah, I can this buy entire egrets entire village sponsored by the ugly duckling. Yeah. What is this pattern on here? I don't think I've ever gotten a look at these. It's kind of oak leaves. Yeah, it does look like oak leaves. Oh, look at the hex uh, shingles <laughs> up here on the roof. Are these meant to be like ceramic shingles or a clay? Uh, probably shingles? red clay tile, yeah. Red clay tile? That would fit. Which we haven't really seen, have we? Well, and Calendon. Uh, Where? Yeah, Calendon. The elf starting area. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. But that doesn't seem to be like an architectural technology. Uh, that Clay's a pretty common yeah. occurrence, anyway. Well, it is, except we haven't, like, we don't see it in the Brewlands. We don't see it. Yeah, and I'm, for, for, I'm from Virginia. We know right, Clay. Right here, yes. So where does this horse take you to? Uh, from... to the uh, the high moor right above the Fort of Bruin and yeah, that's it. High moor encampment. That little group of elves sitting up there. The quest above the Bruin. Inn? Right. <laughs> yeah, it's a shortcut, and you can't get back. There's no return horse. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. So don't do it. <laughs> oh, the ones over like by Giant Valley, like over there. Yeah, no, um, further closer to the Ford itself. Of course, right the switch back. The path yeah. down. Yeah. Okay. Okay. All right. And then there's this little ski chalet back here that I don't know what it's for. We haven't seen it do anything. Well, this, so this is like a modern gazebo, right? This one over here. Oh the, no, this is a gazebo. I'm talking about the house behind it. Oh, the house behind it. Oh look, it, yeah. there's the egret motif again on the in the gazebo. I always thought it was a stable, personally. Yeah, I suppose it could be a stable for more horses. It definitely reminds well, me of like... I was going to say, like, what, the gazebo? I'm like, is that why they put Galdor there? But no, I see, okay. Hang on, I'm still no. looking at the gazebo here because... Oh, yeah, no, it's a fabulous gazebo. This is the first, uh, one of the first, like, modern gazebos that we've seen. Uh -huh. um, also, legitimately elf gazebo, which doesn't have a roof, apparently. That's one of the differences. <sighs> Whereas the Arnorians put arches with, you know... Uh, domes. Yeah, domes and headless statues on top of them, right? They don't yeah. even put glass How do you keep anything. the rain off? Well, yeah. well how would we look at the that. stars if there was a roof? Oh. Right, apparently. <laughs> um... Looks like some kind of snowflake in the middle. Or in here and look up. There's some yeah, sort I of hadn't thought of snowflake. It's five pointed. Never mind. Yeah. Or ten pointed. It's got the little lesser points on the inside. Mm -hmm. Okay. So, oh, but I guess for, for our first real live uh, gazebo that we have, you know, active gazebo that we found with people actively in it right mm -hmm. um apparently gazebos were for like standing around in that's what you do yes I guess. Anyway. there's no difference between me being inside or outside except now i am standing on tile right that's there what this steps. 
That's what Galdor of the Havens and this townsperson are doing. Rather yeah, pointedly you're literally putting yourself on a pedestal. Other. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> right. Okay, we're just looking. What's she looking at? A wall. And Galdor, on the other hand, is What's a little Galdor bit doing? more sensibly watching the approach, right? To see who's coming. Yes. So he's like oh, watching shit. the arrivals, right? Okay. She's watching departures. <laughs> I guess. <laughs> I guess. No, it's the two gates. Yeah. Thank you, Janice. <laughs> anyway, all right, so uh, um, up to your chalet up here. Okay. Yeah. Very Snow White looking. Very Nordic looking. I mean, look at the, look at the, the front of that eave there. This is definitely designed after the turned over ship buildings of the... Yes. But only in one side. It's, it doesn't balance. It's just the one side. It's beautiful, though. But yes, this does make sense. This would make place be a place to house all the other horses because you see all the double doors out here. Right. Yeah, those do look like auxiliary stables, right? Mm -hmm. are, are these the horses' winter quarters or something? Possibly. We're getting on to fall. They probably they oh, probably would appreciate warmer quarters back here yeah no they have, these are probably stables uh, yeah i'm always sad we've never gotten to do anything over here yeah isn't this kind of close to where we found the scepter of anuminus or is that on the other side of the valley i don't remember somewhere quite clamoring around these rocks up here in the northern bits i think it's we're not quite as far north probably as we're... yeah i know bilbo's riddle sends us out here but yeah. Okay. Well, I want to. I want to. I want to move down the other way. Hrothgar is saying that that up there, the chalet up there, is actually Asphaloth's house, <laughs> which you can easily <laughs> believe, thing. right? I mean, Tw twenty nine rooms all to himself. Yeah. Glorfindel's not going to use one of. Yeah. I mean, Asphaloth is going to live in one of these open stables, right? No. Um, no. These must be temporary stables for, you know, like visitors and things. Just as, just as, and they, of course, they look quite a bit like the stables in the Prancing Pony as far as sort of stylistically. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so you think Glorfindel just came back and said, I just got, I just killed a Balrog. You give my horse the <laughs> finest, <laughs> finest right. freaking place ever. I want you to build me a huge mansion for my horse. Opulent horsey it. crib. Yeah. All right, so I want to head down the road uh, here, and I, I want to I want to stay on this side. I want to head over to the uh, uh, to the to the guest house. Love the trees. I was so disappointed by our fall colors this year. We just didn't we got too much rain or not enough or something. But all this fall was just brown. Yeah. So I'd always come here to cheer myself up. Rivendell really is beautiful. They've done a great job with this. I love the, the pine woods right up in the mm -hmm. slopes, which, of course, are alluded to in the book. Um, Frodo yep. wants to get up into the pine woods, right? Um, mm -hmm. I was uh, excited to look around and see the pine woods. So what is this building? Not the bridge. I know all too well what the bridge is. What is this thing? Um, I think this is where the class trainers are. I don't know what the building's called, we, though. I don't know if this one in, has a right? name. This is not just a... Yeah, is this it... is the one you fall off the cliff if you go out, if you approach it on the wrong side. Okay, right. Oh, so it's got a cliff over there. That's nice. Um, yeah. So presumably this would just be a residence, I guess, right? Could be. If, uh, if we have trainers here, I don't know. That might have something to do with it. There's only the one trainer here. The others are scattered oh, the around town. I guess, yeah, I can never tell. So this is where the, I don't know, maybe all the archery equipment is. This is so where the this is like a utility is. shed there for you? This is the, this is the, the hunting the, shed. It's the elvish utility shed. Okay. Might be the, the armory with a skirmish camp right here. Yeah, yeah. Well, the skirmish camp. Mm -hmm. So, I don't like know. Like, there's not enough rooms here. They all got to sleep outside. Yeah. At this point, we can assume it's because we want them. They want to. So, like, the elves are in pup tents. Why again? Yeah, I don't quite get that, honestly. Me neither. It's like camping in the backyard. 
Right. And I guess, you know, you hang out here on logs by the fire. Some of these tents are kind of nice. But, but yeah, you got to think. I mean, what are these, the relatives Elrond doesn't like? I mean, I get, <laughs> I get it, right? It's a skirmish camp, and the skirmish camps are... Sort and it's reindeer games. You know, it's, just, it's training camp. You know, this is to make sure that yeah. when they get out there, they actually can put up a tent. Yeah. I can't put so up this a tent. Is like, My this buffalo is like, isn't here. This is like the elvish. Okay. This is like elf scouts. Yeah. There you go. Yeah. Okay. Uh, elf scouts. Yeah, it's just what Hrothgar was thinking too. Yeah. 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 Uh, well, they don't tell them how to take care of. So look at this guy apparently. using a he's using a two-handed sword trying to stab a dummy over here. He needs all the help he can get. <laughs> look at this guy. Yeah, look, he's got a freaking great sword. I mean, he's strong. I'll give him that. But right, wielding a great sword one-handed and just repeatedly stabbing. The yeah. left of legendary items is just watching him. Like I'm not going to tell him. <laughs> 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 I'm going to wait till he puts down the sword, and then I'm going to tell him. Right now, I fear for my life. And this fox, I thought that this fox was somebody's cosmetic pet, but it's, it's just hanging out. Now climbing, yeah, the, climbing the tent. Like you do. Yeah. Okay. All right. Um, right, yeah, so these are clearly not, like, this elf with the sword is clearly not going to be, you know, intimidating yeah. any ringwraiths into the fort anytime soon. No. Yeah, it's just like... You think at this point Rivendell hasn't had a active standing army for a while, and they've just realized the need for it. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I think. Um, um, so, yeah, okay, I mean, Pat, of course, you're doing I kinda, your best. You know, I, 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 I kind of give them a pass on the whole skirmish camp thing. I mean, the skirmish camps are a set piece in every mm -hmm. settlement, you know, and so. But, but they're all different. I mean, this one's all elves, and it, there there the, is a the definite. People are there's different. names. Yeah. These people have names. Do they? Yes. Look, this is real far. Yeah, and this you're is right. Mala, Malin Lair looking they wistfully at the fire, names. like he, know, they don't he's usually to have make. names. Do they? Yeah. Don't aren't they usually no, called? Yeah, all of them do. They do. Do they? Yeah. Even in the other skirmish camps, they have like names based on whatever race they are. Huh. But it it definitely gives it more of a story here. Yeah. Like, real fair, clearly from Kalondon, because he's wearing the yellow garb that they wear out in Arid Luin. Yeah. Hmm. Well, but yeah, like I said, I don't know. I mean, the um, skirm the whole skirmish camp concept seems to be kind of a, like they're kind of railroaded into this, right? They're like committed to it, whether it makes sense or not. It's interesting that they chose to um, customize the people and the names, but not the like tents. Hmm. You know. They... Yeah, you think the elves would certainly have more spectacular tents than that. Well, yeah, exactly. Their costumes are spectacular, right? They're wearing fancy elf clothes, but they're sleeping in the same, you know, crappy little <laughs> pup tents that the, you know. The tents are left over from the last incident in Rivendell, <laughs> so they look like that. Yeah, they kind of do. Well. It... It's mainly going to be a case of uh, having resources already developed. So they had the the NPC models for all the elves already created for other things. They just plopped them down, maybe recolored a couple things. Well, and yeah, that's the logical the tents thing. The tents. That's the logical thing. The point is to see it on the landscape and try to make mm -hmm. sense of it. Because exactly. these are elves clearly in their Sunday duds because they don't <laughs> have camping clothes. Right. Or right. they're not aware that they needed any. And these tents are probably borrowed from Esseldine. Okay, now. I love this bridge. I was so happy the first time I saw this bridge and fell off of it. Oh, yes. Um, well, the falling off part, but still. So, okay, so we're, I'm looking. So the river... We're flowing this way. So the... F and, I, and I'm sad that I, you, I did... Uh, fall off here and try to make the best of it by um, uh, swimming down to the ford, which mm -hmm. sadly I couldn't do. Mm -mm. Uh, yeah. Which is really too bad. What I really like about, I really like the gorge here because you can sort of easily see how if 
a flood is released from up here, how it would be focused and intensified by this gorge as it goes through, right? By gravity, yeah. Yeah. Um, so we will think more about the river and the flood as we explore the other side of the valley and see where the river is coming from. But from here, we can see the big fall behind the house over there, uh, and we can see that that secondary fall there. Um, flowing off towards right, yep, yeah, because I'm indeed facing west, right? So that's off towards um, uh, looping around to the ford as we saw it in... Hang on, let me go out a little bit here. Yeah, there we go. Pointing right towards the ford there. So that's pretty cool. So this is definitely the channel that the river flood will, would have gone through. You think Gandalf was standing here when he set the horses? Y you know, it would be a, a, a good vantage for it. Where mm -hmm. like, where the flood wa waters are gathered and how they're released is, I think, a, an interesting question, right? So, yeah. Uh, and I'd be surprised if the developers hadn't thought about that question. Yeah, uh, absolutely. When they, uh, when they made this. My big so. question is, do you think there's also a physical element, like there's a reservoir there? Just in, that's built up just in case as well. Well, you know, um, yeah. Well, we'll talk about this when we okay. get there in the text and in the uh, in the landscape, as it's already getting late. So I think this house will probably be our last stop here this evening. Um, okay. But of course, this is a significant place, uh, as this is the guest rooms where the fellowship stays. We're told that uh, they're given a house. Um, uh, well, no, we're not told that here. I, I was thinking of a different thing. Told that later, I suppose. Yeah, we're told that in a different place. Um, and because notice, not everybody is staying here. The hobbits are staying in the house. Yeah. Uh, in in the main house. Um, also, notice that the guest house is as far away from Elrond as it could be. Yeah, it's really out there. And whom we see here are Legos, Gimli, and Aragorn, right? Here is mm -hmm. Legolas still staring fixedly at the wall. I don't know if he's supposed to be staring at the map and just got distracted by the uh, I'll decorations. I'll shift his weight in a minute. Yeah. Yeah. But. There's also a little chest deal here. Gimli just looks like he's trying to pick what purse he's wearing today. <laughs> this is Gimli this, accessorizing. Yeah. This is this one goes with my boots, but clashes with the cape. <laughs> I, I, I I like the fact that still packed luggage is here, right? We're 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 seeing the fellowship preparing Man, to depart. I've been in my house six years. I still have boxes I haven't unpacked. Right, right. You can almost read this thing tacked to the wall. It's written in English, though. Ah. Which thing? The one that oh, me, we Hobbit is staring at. Oh. Whoops, sorry. Didn't mean to stand no, on you there. Oh, the sign. Yeah. The note. Plus is this. Oh. That is in the common speech, that is. I will... Work on something, and the something use the world just as my grandfather did. Is this a bingo thing? No, I don't I think, think so. so. I, I think this this Plus is just the signatures at the bottom. Yeah. Benjamin something or other. It looks like it could be Benjamin. Benjamin Burroughs. Who's that? No idea. Oh. Uncle. The third paragraph starts with uncle. Ends an uncle orphan. Bilbo. Something something becomes an orphan. Maybe. Help me. Help me become a something. Yeah. Presumably not egg? orphan. Yeah. I've never be, noticed yeah. this note tacked to the wall before. I've seen these. I've seen these decorations elsewhere in games. So this is just obviously again an out of character thing that they just use for you know interior decorating, but it's still very puzzling. It is puzzling. It makes me wonder what it does say and what it was intended for and who came up with it and if it's some sort of inside joke. 
Yeah. Interesting. I never really noticed that before. And you can make out a bunch of it. Or if it's, you know, a quest idea that fell by the wayside, you know? Right. Nope, Aragorn's packed too. I yes. love the, the harp here. Is this a harp or is this a window screen? I can't figure that out. <laughs> I think it's a harp. That are a... Well, you'd have your high notes on both ends and then your low notes in the middle. Yeah, I mean, it's a weird harp. I don't know what, so maybe it's a what window else it could screen. be. A very large egg slicer. Um, yeah. Cheese grater. Loom. I don't know. Hmm. I think it would be a harp. I think it would be a harp, too. I the one think, I want is, why are there snowshoes out in the foyer? Uh, well, they live next to the Misty Mountains. It's not a weird It's not yeah. a weird thing to have out here. They're next to the Misty Mountains. But they think they're going south. But I, guess, I suppose if they were planning going across the, across the mountains instead of under, that makes sense. Also, if Gim we don't know which direction Gimli took because his uncle is up in Misty Mountains. Or his, or his dad, sorry, his dad's up in Misty Mountains. Right, true. Yeah. Oh, somebody left this bottle of wine completely unguarded. What are these maps? Usually the maps that they have on tables are like game maps. Oh, yes, this is from the uh, battle map um furniture piece i think you can get somewhere oh i love the the leaf design burned on there but yeah look at the little uh look at the little general dealies made out of wood here yeah so it's like definitely this is some sort of detailed terrain of, a, of an area maybe like pelinor or something you wonder though Moranin. why he's i mean that he would be studying maps to be thinking about their root makes all kinds of sense. Mm -hmm. I don't know what Little that's people, meant to not so be. Much. This, well, what, this is, this is with yeah. a cleft in the middle there? Yeah. What is that? Yeah. Uh, the Black Gate? See. I mean, what is it supposed to be? I don't, Misty I don't Mountains? Know. Maybe yeah. Misty Mountains. It looks like a, a real extreme close-up of something, actually. It like it looks like a map of the inside of Casa Doom going down to the General Dale. If you're looking at it in the direction I'm facing, like they did a cutaway so you could see like the Twenty First Hall and whatever. Oh, mm. that makes sense to me. It looks like that's like the arid arid Lewin with the bay coming in on this side, anyway. <laughs> it's a Moria Street view shot, Rothgar. Yeah, maybe. Um, that would be another interesting piece of foreshadowing, um, this, uh, like the snowshoes, right? Yeah, we, we do find out that he had no intention of going, so. Yeah. What are those but, yeah, it might be, I get the feeling it's more Mordor related, though, because at this point, he he's pretty much determined... Yes, though, yes... I mean, he would be thinking about, one could imagine him thinking about the eventual infiltration of Mordor. Yes. Right? Yeah. Um, yeah, Rothgar, I thought it looked vaguely Blackgate-ish as well, not very clearly Blackgate-ish, mm -hmm. but, and if we look at things from his perspective here, from mm -hmm. this side... Uh, I don't know. It doesn't seem yeah, it's cool to, from I, here. I do think it looks like the Miranda. From from no, my it's... angle, it does, yeah. Because you see, like, the two pinchers coming in. Uh -huh. mm -hmm. Yeah. That's the best I can think of. As far as just thinking of a place where that... I mean, if that is a detailed terrain map, where would it be? And that, if so, if it is meant to be the Miranda, that is a uh, deep piece of foreshadowing, right? Mm -hmm. uh, on his part. But of course it does make sense too, not just as a foreshadowing of the battle that we know but he does not, that he will be fighting at the end, um, but rather that's the main way into Mordor, right? Um, you mm -hmm. know, until Gollum leads them to uh, uh, to Kirithungol 
all of them, Frodo, and I mean, when Frodo tells Gollum to take him to the gate, right, he's not speaking just arbitrarily or completely out of ignorance. Um, presumably, this is what he was to, he was, we're told he has shown a map of Mordor in Rivendell. Um, so, uh, you know, presumably he is told in Rivendell that the way to get into Mordor is through the Black Gate, through, you know, at the Moran. Uh-huh. So, um, you know, maybe this is like the map that, uh, or part of the map that Frodo was shown in Rivendell, right? Maybe. Uh-huh. Um, yeah. Fourth Dauntless, you're right that Aragorn does plan to go to Bo- to Gondor with Boromir because he believes that the dream is a summons. Yes, yes. Um, which, again, is one of the reasons why I'm thinking instead of planning his own path here, he could be looking at this like for the sake of trying to help educate Frodo, right? It's very likely. We're not that told. does make a lot of sense. Frodo uses the passive voice, right? I was shown a, uh-huh. a map in Rivendell, he says, and he doesn't say by whom. Um, no. So Aragorn could certainly be involved in that process here. Yes. Interesting. Okay. All right. Well, practical, tactical genius. Exactly. We should, uh, we should probably uh, go here. There's much more to discover in Rivendell, but since we will probably be in Rivendell for the next <laughs> year and a half, um, uh, we'll Sorry. have plenty of time <laughs> to explore Rivendell and the Misty Mountains and the rest of Angmar as well. Um, so we'll, I think we should probably sign off there. Thanks, everybody, for joining me here tonight uh, as we begin our, our uh, explorations of Rivendell, thinking about uh, how the game is adapting and thinking about not only uh, the what the details we're told about Rivendell, but about sort of elf culture as well. Um, but uh, anyway, thanks very much, everybody, for joining us. See you guys in a fortnight. Uh, yeah. Remember, no class next week, but we'll be back two weeks from now. So thanks, everybody. Good night. Thanks, everyone. Good night. Night. Thanks for joining me on this epic exploration of The Lord of the Rings and of Standing Stone's video adaptation of Tolkien's story. If you are having even half the fun I'm having on this journey, I hope you will consider supporting the project by donating at signumuniversity.org fund.